two summers ago, I was in LA working out in Glendale and um, I saw Luke Walton there. And this was before I signed an NBA. And, and I asked him like, yo, Luke, you know, I'm, I, I'm a fringe NBA guy. I'm playing in Europe right now, but like, I'm trying to get my foot in the door. What do I need to do? He said, listen, I don't know your game too much, but whatever you do, just make sure you're the best at it and make sure you do it every time. And that was simple. You know, he was like, he was giving some examples of the guys that was playing. He said, this guy, like, he wants to show that he's tween, tween, tween. But NBA teams ain't looking for that. He's 6'10", and he wants to shoot pull-up jump shots. Like, yes, you can do that. But on, on your team, there's probably going to be someone else that does that better than you. And he has the license for it. So don't be, don't be too humble to just rebound and set screens. And I never had no problems doing that because I know I can do that at a high level. I know I can do more. But in my sleep, I should be able to rebound with the best of them. So it was it was amazing hearing that from him because it reinforced my thoughts. Well, welcome back to the Role Player Podcast, still presented to you by the good folks at Switch Cultures and Eurohoops.net. Make sure you check us out on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. Also, follow us along on all social media platforms as YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter with the handle at Role Player Media and also on Swiss Culture's YouTube page. I am Jordan Taylor, 12-year pro, EuroLeague vet, rolling with the multi-talented Stanford gentleman, retired 11-year pro and Swiss Culture's co-founder, the one and only Mr. Anthony Goods. Goods, what's happening with you? You all right? Nah, man, I'm good, man. Especially especially seeing my beard shitting on yours. You know man. what I mean? It's, it's a good day. It's always a good day. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? If I... I feel like if our beers were to play like ones right now, this would be a mismatch. But I <laughs> yeah. need you to get to the barber ASAP. Let's play real. Let's play real ones. See what happens. <laughs> nah, you got it. <laughs> play got real ones. No one. Man, it's been a long week for me. Somebody told me to go to Turkey yesterday. I was hurt. Damn. <laughs> I was hurt. I was asking for. It. I was talking hella shit myself. But you know, it is what it is. So I'm gonna get back right though. I'm gonna go to the barber and get all them enhancements for next week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but but listen, man, we got a we got a very good guest with us today, man. A French Cup winner, in 2023 FIBA Basketball Champions League Most Valuable Player in 22, a FIBA Basketball Champions League First Team honoree and All Defensive Team honoree and all ACB team in 2022, and we can take it back to his college days. He's been doing this thing for a long time, all Big West in 2017. Now currently of bat playing with Basconia in the Euro League, the one and only Mr. Chima Moneke. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's perfect. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, I ain't, I ain't say it like the Spanish cats, I don't think, but I tried, man. <laughs> <but, laughs> yeah. That was good. That was good. No, yeah, no, we appreciate you jumping on, man. But before we get into to some of the topics we want to talk about, I'm just going to kick it off. Um, for those that don't know, you've had a, a, for lack of a better term, just a wild background to high-level basketball. I think more one of the uh, unique paths to NBA EuroLeague. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these, but parents that worked at the Nigerian embassy in Australia, correct? Correct. Among, among other places. Yeah. But yeah, among, among other places, um, we've talked extensively, uh, about kind of how lineage works in basketball, how having professional athletes as parents is, is very helpful. Um, but you went from, what was it from Australia? No, you're born in, in Abuja, Nigeria, correct? <laughs> went, went to us went to australia and then came to the states for community college first and then uh went to uc went to uc davis for college which a lot of times you know i feel like a lot of guys go to you know whatever it is if they're going to come to the states from australia and go that path they kind of go to to whatever it is you know maybe big whatever big east whatever it is first so i guess just talk to us first about how that upbringing has shaped your view of basketball and of the game yeah, so for me, um, like you said, I don't have basketball parents, um, so that's the start of it. I wanted to be a football player, soccer, um, Nigerians, that's our sport. So, like, to me, I knew that's what I wanted to do, and everything changed when I turned 13. When I moved back to Australia for high school, you know, I was probably six foot, six foot one then, and I, I tried basketball. At the time, I was a big fan of watching it because of LeBron. But like I didn't have any passion or desire to play it. I wanted to be a football player, but I tried it. it. wasn't that good, but I liked it. You know, I liked it. I had like natural instincts to rebound the ball and just be in the right places, and it was fun. 
Um, won, we won the title in my first season, so you know I, I had some some more desire to keep playing. Um, and then I guess the biggest thing that you know made me decide that I really want to do this was two years into playing in 2011. I was getting better. I was one of the best players in the state, and then I got cut like inexplicably. I was the last person to get cut before representing my state, and that like yeah it changed everything for me. And I I just knew at that moment I didn't I didn't give a fuck what no one else had to say about what I wanted to do or who I would be. And you know that's when the flexing started. That's when all of the um the talking shit. That's when my energy, my character came out. And from there, I just I knew it would take a lot, but I knew that I would get to where I'm at now, and I'm grateful. For that. What made you? But what was it inside? Because I'm a big fan of just uh, I guess unorthodox in general. And I, to me, I guess I asked that question because you could, like you said, you could see it in your game like I feel like basketball tells a lot about a person maybe whether it is how they are or their background whatever it is and you undersized big man high motor like it's just fun to watch you know what I'm saying you don't really need the ball to be effective so what about all of that made you know that you was going to get to where you was going just because like um my belief in myself is just is more powerful than anyone else's doubts or words or whatever like people people always used to say Chima was good but Chima was good, but, and I just got tired of it. And I'm like, why am I listening to this person? If this person said Chima was good and there was there was no buts to the sentence, would I stop working the way that I was supposed to be working? Would I stop playing the way I was supposed to be playing? So like early on, I learned not to give a fuck about what people are saying about me and play my game. You know, I, I don't let people turn me into a player that I'm not. I try my best not to let that happen. And, you know, for me to get to Euroleague and get to the NBA playing the way I play, like it's, I think it's inspirational for a lot of people that if you believe in yourself and, you know, you just be great at what you are, be great at what you do and make sure you do that every time. Like that's not negotiable for me. That's, that's how I think. And yeah, it's the proof is in the pudding. Can't get to the Euroleague and get to the NBA unless you deserve to be there. And I work my ass off to get there. Yo, I got a question about because I think I think one of the things special about your game in particular, as we mentioned, is the motor. And I think that for a lot of basketball players, like even uh, even guys that don't necessarily have a motor, you know, you go through college, you go through, you know, you go through college and you learn how to play hard. Then you go to pros and you learn what playing hard is at that at that level. Yeah. Um. So I guess my question is, is like, did you? Was your motor always like consistent or was there a particular point in your career where it just kicked up to another notch and it just started to make sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think my motor has always been like something that I needed to be good. Um, Cause I'm like, I'm listed at six, six, but I'm really six, five and a quarter. And like, that's just the truth. Like, I don't, I don't mind telling the truth. Like, for me to be my size and rebound the way I do and play, like I've always been, I feel like the best rebound on my teams, you know, um, and I've needed to be that to get to where I'm at. And yeah, so I think I always had that, but obviously as you get older, you learn more about yourself that, you know, things just get better. Um, I think in college was when um, my coach told me that, you know, I needed to be that guy every time and it was hard. Like it was hard in practice and in games, like crashing the boards every time. That's it's not it's not fun, but like I had something in me that made it easier for me to do than other people. And yeah, like it's still it's still a hard thing. Like I still have days where I'm like, man, I ain't got it. But then I find a way to show that I got it, and yeah, I think I'm blessed that way. To me, it sounds like the biggest lesson to take away just in this short time so far is like you have this um, crazy understanding of like how to accept what is, I guess, if that makes sense. Like it, and that kind of leads into talking about pro B and basketball is not always fun, right? Goods can attest to that, especially overseas. So playing pro B, what were the challenges of, of kind of, cause I'm sure you felt like you should have been at a, at a quote unquote higher level coming out of college, right? Oh, no doubt. So how did you – what was the mental and how did you accept 
being at that level um, and and go through that process while propelling yourself upwards, I guess? I mean, I, I'll take it back to before pro B and I didn't, like I said, I started basketball late, so I was behind. You know, guys grew up with basketball in their hands. They were born with it. They had parents that played the game, whatever. So I knew I was behind. I started at 13. I'm, I'm already behind. When I get to America, I'm not Division One straight away. I'm mm-hmm. Juco. Okay, so I, I got work to do, right? Not Some people do one year of Juco. I did two. And when I finally get to D1, I redshirt my first year. So getting to Pro B is my first job. Like I, It just made sense for me in my life. Obviously, I knew I could play um, the first division straight away. But I also understood that like situations are different, and you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And I I learned not to do that because I had friends in the NBA making millions, and I'm getting two thousand two hundred a month, and I'm just like, God damn, right? <laughs> but I also knew that my end game would be like it would be there, and it would make all of the shit that I was going through at the time worth it. Um, but it's funny because I get to second division. And my rookie year, my coach isn't rocking with me. I get cut after three games. Mm-hmm. And then so like that made me question every like I think I'm I think I'm gonna play in the NBA. I wanna play in the NBA and I'm getting cut in Pro B. How does that make sense? <laughs> but, like that those probably the lowest moments of my basketball career. Because that was my first taste of professional basketball at a level that I thought I was better than. And the coach basically told me I wasn't good enough. So like I had to check myself. I had to go back and, you know, watch college highlights at the time to remind myself of who I was. But then, you know, at the end of the day, I, my mentality was fuck that. Like, I, I know who I am and where I want to be, so. Yo, what, uh, and this is this is for, well, I guess, Chimi, you just, you just shared, George, with JT. Like, what is something that you've done? Like, let's say you've been playing, you've been in a slump, you've been playing terrible. What is something that you've done to get yourself out of that? <laughs> Uh, my girl in the room, so it's uh. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Nor- honestly, um, normally for me, I, I started a little slow at Asvel. It's normally just kind of trying to it's trying to make overseas basketball as normal as possible. Meaning, like when you play overseas, like I feel like your life in a lot of places, most places, your life is on hold. So. To me, it's kind of creating that regularity in your life where it's like, all right, I'm just at the crib where it's like, to me, that makes your job easier. Even the days where it's not fun, you're like, all right, like I'm going to leave here and I'm going to go do something with a friend or whatever it is. It's just there's a release away from basketball to release your mind or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt like I felt like a lot of times what I would do is I would get back into the gym and I would take it back to like. 10 years old like nobody's out there like you see the defenders but they're not there and you just kind of just you know I used to just get back to using my imagination because I feel like a lot of times when you struggle a lot of times you're just overthinking you know you're not you're not just reacting or doing what you normally do but you know when you're in the gym by yourself and ain't nobody there to rebound or whatever it is you know you kind of just let your mind work and you know you create the scenarios yourself but uh, I, I just always thought it was interesting how how guys get them out of how how guys get themselves out of those type of situations. What what, I, what I, would you have something to add, Chima? My bad. No, no, no. I mean, I I feel like yeah. I'm either I watch my my old tapes, old videos, or I get away from the game. And like you said, I think overthinking is the biggest part of it. Mentally, if you're struggling, and basketball is everything to you, and it's, you know, making you upset or you feel like you're letting yourself down because you're not playing as well. Take a break from it. Get away from it and, you know, remind yourself it is a game and you're good at it. Like, remember that. You're good at it. You're just struggling right now. I always say this to anyone. Bad game does not mean bad player. Right. And that's how I feel. And, and to further that, I think bad situation uh might not necessarily be you so i guess you know you said your coach cut you after three games at what point is for both of y'all like at what point in your career was it you realize like maybe the people making the decisions are dumb as fuck man i knew that straight away (laughs) i knew that straight away like i just it was just hard to remind myself because i was overseas and i was 
I got cut and I had to practice with them for six weeks. And every day I'm in practice busting ass, like busting ass with no smile on my face and like looking at the coach and it didn't matter what I did. Like he just didn't like me. And that's not, that was the first time in my professional career, but it wasn't the last time I dealt with that just last season. And I'm sure we'll get to that. But like, <laughs> I felt that and there was just nothing I could do about it. So I, I always had to make sure that I remembered who I am and, and then I'm him. Just so we're clear, before we do get to that, what situation specifically are you talking about? Uh, where you just dealt yeah, with it last yeah. year? You talking about yeah, Monaco. in Monaco, Monaco, correct? Okay. Monaco sure. And I and yeah, and I, I played for Sasha too. So yeah, we'll get to it. Can't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so I guess what do you knowing that like sometimes decision makers are questionable? Maybe sometimes it is you're struggling. Whatever that may be. What do y'all feel like, as an American, what's the biggest difference in level across across Europe? So say you playing in Pro B, you know you could play first division France. You clearly know you clearly knew you could play in the NBA, which is the highest level. So what do you think is that separate? What do y'all think is that separator between being in Pro B or being at, in the NBA, EuroLeague, whatever it is? Because you want to go. Yeah, you first. to guess. You to yeah, guess. Yeah, you always first. <laughs> you always uh, first. I'm, I mean, I think I think it's just I. The first part is I respect all levels of basketball. There's a lot of guys in pro B that can play pro A in the right situation. There's a lot of guys in the NBA that they could go to a bad situation in Euroleague and they will look below average. So like I I understand that. Um, you take a bunch of pros and put them in the gym, and if you don't know anyone's faces or names. A lot of guys just look good. And that obviously you'll get the the elites of the elites that are just elite anywhere they go, right? But I think like 80% of NBA players are really good role players. And they're a lot of them are in the right situation and some of them don't look as good because they're not in the right situation. They could go to EuroLeague and I think NBA and EuroLeague is right there. And some guy, like there's a bunch of example of guys that struggled when they went to Europe doesn't mean they're bad players. They just went to the wrong situation. So with that being said, like, I just knew Pro B, like, they just couldn't handle me if I got a chance to play. Just because of athleticism and IQ. In Pro B, it's very physical. And the way they call the game for foreigners is different. Um, so I, I guess those are the, the two main things. But the guys that stand out, you got to make sure you stand out every game. You can't just go to Pro B thinking you're the best and, and just be regular. Yeah, I think I think the biggest difference between levels is uh if you're if you're a decent basketball player is a situation and efficiency. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think like like in Pro B, I mean you're gonna get, you know, if you're that guy, you're gonna get the reps. You know what I mean? You're gonna get the ball in whatever situation you want it. Um I think as you move up to Pro A now you're on a team where everybody's shooting the ball eight times. You know what I'm saying? Even the guys that ain't supposed to shoot the ball eight times. So now you have to really, like, dial back a little bit and be efficient. You know what I'm saying? And now – and that's where I say situation also, you know, uh, plays a big role because, you know, as a guard, like, if you're more comfortable with top on balls and then, you know, you go to another situation where they got you on the side on balls and, you know, in this particular league, they're forcing everything down here or on the side – you might struggle. You might not be as comfortable. You know what I'm saying? And I think situation is the biggest key in regards to a player looking good or not, you know, as opposed to just the level. Because I think that there are players – I mean, you look at some of the best players in Europe now, they all came from like a second division somewhere. You know what I'm saying? And then they got out of that and got into another good situation and then another good situation. You know what I'm saying? So – uh, you know, that's where I tell, like, a lot of young guys, man, really do your homework. Know, know the coach that you're getting into or that you go out to play for because yeah. that's going to dictate where your shots are coming from and how you're going to be used. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, too, you might, as a guard, you might have a big that doesn't roll. You know, you want them to roll, like, all them little things. Like, I, I honestly think that there, when I was younger, I mean, I still think there is a difference to a degree, but me personally, I'm like – Honestly, especially as a six one, six two guard, like shoot, it's a crapshoot. Like, you're not six two. 
You're not six yeah, you two. Stop hating and get money. You're not. Stop hating. Stop You're hating and get money. I'm six Tima two. came on I'm here with two. a shot of truth. He was <laughs> yeah, like, no, I'm really <laughs> six five. The least you could do. The least you could do. This man's being vulnerable. The least you could do is be honest with yourself. You're I'm being vulnerably two. honest. You can go to the websites and type it in. You'll get six two <laughs> on record. Six one and three quarters, my niggas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> but right. anyway, that's neither here. This is about Chima. This is not about you. Stop being selfish, man. Pass the rock. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, from Chiba, to get back to that, talk to, about you personally um, it, along the lines of the same topic. Like, was there anything that you recognized? Like, obviously, you always had that confidence in yourself. Was there anything that, like, clicked for you as you were going through Pro B to, to Pro A to, um, to, to Basketball Champions League? Was there anything, and NBA and beyond, was there anything that clicked in your game that you were like, oh, I know this is what I do, or was there anything personally? It was like this is what gets me success. Yeah, re rebounding for sure. Um, I mean, like, yeah, I think the numbers that I've put up rebounding wise on every team that I've played major minutes, I think it's like it's. I think it's exceptional because of my size, and you know, I guard a lot of guys that are six nine and six ten, and like they don't want no, they don't want no parts of me like when I crash the boards and I'm running and I don't know yeah I just I was born not born with it but when I started playing like I just had the instincts to get rebounds at a high level so I made sure that that was my thing and like I knew that but then also I think two summers ago I was in LA working out in Glendale and um I saw Luke Walton there and this was before I signed an NBA and, and I asked him like Yo, Luke, you know, I'm I, I'm a fringe NBA guy. I'm playing in Europe right now, but, like, I'm trying to get my foot in the door. What do I need to do? He said, listen, I don't know your game too much, but whatever you do, just make sure you're the best at it and make sure you do it every time. And that was simple. You know, he was, like, he was giving some examples of the guys that was playing. He said, this guy, like, he wants to show that he's tween, 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 but NBA teams ain't looking for that. He's 6'10", and he wants to shoot pull-up jump shots. Like, yes, you can do that, but... On, on your team, there's probably going to be someone else that does that better than you, and he has the license for it. So don't be don't be too humble to just rebound and set screens. And I never had no problems doing that because I know I can do that at a high level. I know I can do more, but in my sleep, I should be able to rebound with the best of them. So it was it was amazing hearing that from him because it reinforced my thoughts. But yeah, rebounding, athleticism, motor for sure. Do y'all feel like rebounding? What do you feel like rebounding is the most translatable skill in basketball, like across levels? And if so, or if not, what do you think is the most trans ah, rebounding or defense? I would say, I just I think defense. Yeah, I think it's got to be defense. I think it's got to be defense. Okay. Or re re rebound is close too. That's a good question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question. I'm 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 gonna let Goods answer, and then I'm gonna come back to you on a personal level. I think I, I think it's uh I think it's rebounding. I think rebounding is the most. Uh, I think it translates against or across all levels. I think it's hard to like when you think about it. The only defense against a good rebounder is somebody that can block out. But like, who's really working on blocking out? You know what I'm saying? It's like if you're a great defender and you put the best offensive player, you're gonna you're gonna lose. You're gonna <laughs> lose. You know what I mean? But as far as rebounding, like you could out effort you know ninety percent of players and get to your average rebounding. You know what I'm saying? You're not gonna out effort the best offensive player and stop him from getting to his average. You know so. I think that uh, I think that you know defense and rebounding both come down to effort, but I think that rebounding, uh, especially, I think that that's it's just more easily you know translatable across different levels. I'm a I'm gonna go with shooting as the most translatable skill across different levels. Just being able to shoot the basketball, I think you could go anywhere and play damn near, maybe minus the NBA, damn near regardless of size. Like I think you, if you could shoot the ball, that's an emotional play. skill though. Mm. An emotional a, skill. It's an emotional skill. Like you, you have guys that could shoot the piss out of the rock and practice, and then they get inside their head, and then they can't shoot in the game. Or they're playing against somebody that's you know uh, a great defender, and then they start taking shots. Like it's an emotional skill. Like, it, can, I like can, can I make that same argument about rebounding? 
no, 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 no. no I can't because no. I know guys who got who are crazy rebounders and got a motor at lower levels. They get to a higher level and they see a dog and that so that little poodle goes back inside their chest. No, I just I, I disagree. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna add on this one. Okay. Also, in Europe, there's some guys that can shoot with certain balls. Yeah, like that's that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, some guys don't want to go to certain leagues because they don't play with that small. That molten, that molten, that molten will humble all of us. That molten is terrible. That'll humble all of us, man. That's that's these that's y'all young cats, man. That young cat, (laughs) yeah, young syndrome. I know that. I know young blood. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Nah, but so. I asked that question again from a, again from, from a personal standpoint, standpoint. Going to the NBA, and this is just my thoughts. I feel like just watching you. I, I didn't know Ant actually told me a lot about you when you went to the Kings. So I started watching, and I feel like you was almost a little late. Like if you would have been in, because I just think, and if you don't like this comparison, I think it's a great comment. I think like Kenneth Fareed, like that type of player when Kenneth Fareed was just getting every rebound. And nowadays, his value in the NBA just isn't what it used to be, which is the only reason I don't say rebound anymore. I feel like you see guys like Luka getting 10 rebounds a game, and you might go to the NBA and get six. Anybody that would say Luka's a better rebounder than you is crazy, right? Right, right. Just because yeah. rebounds now, like nobody hits the offensive glass like they used to in the league. Like it's really you shooting, you getting back on defense. So just do you feel like rebounding being your main skill, your best skill at all, hindered you in your transition to the league no i just think the kings was just the wrong situation for me because um they hadn't made the playoffs for 17 years and then they got a team that's incredible and like there was just hesitation to try new people like rashawn holmes was he signed a 16 million dollar contract a year and he just didn't get a chance to play so like if he's not getting a chance i'm not gonna get a chance like i i understood that you know i was on a I was on a contract, but like I had stipulations in my contract. It was after a certain point, it's more guaranteed and then fully guaranteed. So, you know, I'm happy for them because they had a really good season. You know, one of the best seasons in history. They brought the life back, but at the same time, like I was like, ah, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's the place for me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm self-aware, you know. But, you know, you said the Kenneth Reed. I've heard that comparison, but look at a guy like Jay Sean Tate. He got paid in the NBA. He went to Houston and he's a he does what he does. He went to Sydney Kings and was doing what he did and he got a chance and he played for Houston. And he, I know I could do, I know I could have done that in the right situation. Mm-hmm. But I'm not a victim. I'm not salty about it. I just know that mm-hmm. that's how it goes. Um and I'm happy in Europe and I'm never gonna say never to the NBA, but I just wanna make sure that I'm happy because last season in Sacramento and in, in the G League and in Monaco, like it took away a lot of my happiness. And I just want to make sure that I never lose that again. Talk about how how uh, it took away some of your happiness. NBA is a is a business, man. Like it's you know the coach may like you a lot, and then the GM you may not be the first choice of the GMs. Um, so it's like, uh, do we like him? Are we going to give him a shot type thing? And, and then as guys get more opportunities and more reps and you just, you just feel it. Like you feel it, you feel that you feel who's prioritized. And some people have worked to get that. Some people are seen by the, the, the staff as guys that they're doing a favor by even letting them come into training camp. You feel all of that. Like no one's naive to it. There's some guys that can you can make two mistakes, and those two mistakes are one too many it's compared to another guy that's making 10 mistakes because he's valued more. And I saw that as soon as training camp started with Sacramento. Mm. And that fucked me up. That made me like start overthinking. That made me start making mistakes. And I'm just like, what is going on? Am I even going to make it to the opening day? Like, I started playing bad, and I was in my head, and then, they told me that I was going to the G League and I was just depressed. Like I was literally, I was playing depressed basketball. I don't know what my numbers were in the G, but like I had some good games, but I was rarely happy there just because coming from Europe and knowing that if I stayed in Europe, I would have finally played Euro League and the environment, everyone knows what Euro League environments are like. And I'm watching, 
I'm watching partisan games with 22,000 people and mm. I'm going to play in Salt Lake City and there's 20 people in the gym <laughs> and it's freezing. It's a hockey rink. Like I was just, oh my goodness. I was not happy with basketball. And then I went to Monaco and I thought, you know, okay, fresh start. And then I go to a team that's top four in, in EuroLeague and the coach is telling me this and I get there. I'm like, this nigga don't like me. <laughs> I knew it. I felt it straight away. And yeah, so last year I was making the most money in my career by far. But then I was like in a place where it was similar to my first year when I got cut, just knowing that I wasn't liked or appreciated. Mm, well, for the record with Monaco, I just I just want to let viewer the listeners know Sasha Obradovich, great great dude off the court, man. That's my dog. That man is certifiably crazy. Like, and he say every year that he, he gonna get less and less crazy. That, that's my that's my dog though. So I, you don't got to speak on that specifically, but <laughs> I got no uh, worries. Yeah, <laughs> um, so in in training camp, you're saying you feel that. What? I guess describe, you said you're making mistakes, you're doing all that. Like, what are you doing? Is there anything you could do to counteract that? Did you learn anything from that experience? Say, when the next time you get back, like, what are you going to take into training camp? So, okay, so why I say training camp is when I felt everything changed was I got there, like, first week of August, and NBA training camp was end of September. So for those six weeks, it was probably, like, I remember it was me, Keon, uh, Delhi. Foxy was in there um, and guys was like sprinkling in there, but it was never the full team. The full team didn't show up until a, a week before training camp. So like I was playing and I was, I was hooping. Like we, it was us five or us six. And then we play against local guys. And like, I was hooping. I was playing free. I was, I felt incredible. I was like, yo, I'm, I'm going to get a chance to like be in the rotation with how I was playing. And then more and more guys started coming in, and then we started tracking wins. We started tracking wins for every game that we played. And it was, this was over three weeks. And they would give a winner for week one, winner for week two, and winner for week three, and then an overall winner. I didn't win any, any of those first three weeks, but I was top. I was second in each, three, each week, and I was the overall winner. So I was like going into training camp, I'm like, I've shown something. Like, I showed I'm intangibles, whatever. Then training camp starts. They got 20 guys in training camp. And, you know, you got the black the black team, uh, the starters. You got Keegan, uh, Sabonis, Fox, HB. And then you got guys rotating from the first and second team, right? And then you got the second team is gray, and then the third team is uh, purple or whatever. And I was always on the fourth team, and I'm like, uh, I see what's going on. So, like, I felt that. Every other four man was rotating between the third, second, and the first team. And I was the only one that didn't get any reps with the first team. So, like, I felt, okay. And I'm the type of person, like, I'm emotional as it is. Like, and this is the NBA. This is my dream. Like, I'm not trying to fuck it up. And I'm just like, damn, man. Am I even going to make the team? Like, I'm telling people I signed with the Kings. And I got some money guaranteed. But then I get more guaranteed if I'm on the opening day roster. So, like, at this point, probably two days into training camp, I'm like, oh. And then I start, like, just doing I just started making mistakes that like I don't normally make. And I started overthinking and I'm talking to coaches like, what do I need to do? I'd have a great day and then the next day will be bad. And I'm just like, man, then I made the team and I went to the G League and yeah, you know, everything was just different. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's interesting because now Sasha Vizankov is over there in Sacramento and um you know, I was talking to uh, one of my guys who's uh, who's been watching training camp, and they were saying how Sasha was kind of like – when he first got there, he was just kind of trying to fit in, playing that European basketball and all that other stuff. And, then, you know, the, they've been having conversations with him, like, yo, shoot the rock. And then he's had – you know, he's, he's done well in preseason. But, you know, I, I was talking to JT about this. Like, I feel like – a lot of teams, like, when they sign in a guy from overseas or whatever it is, they know who their rotation is, you know? They're still <laughs> signing you to get into – it's not like they're signing you to be a part of this, like, rotation. Like, it's not like drafting you in the lottery. So, um, you know, I think it's – I think it's extremely difficult, you know, coming over from, you know, the international – again, we haven't even mentioned adjusting to the style of play. 
Mm -hmm. Like it's completely different. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's just a lot that goes through your mind outside of just trying to get out there and perform, you know what I'm saying? And doing what you do. And uh, but look, and, and, and look, I signed a, a minimum, a minimum deal with 250 guaranteed when I signed 500 on opening day. And if I made it past January 7th, um, one point one million, whatever it was, right? Sasha signed a three year, 20 million guaranteed. Mm -hmm. That's different. Mitch has signed a crazy contract. Like that's, Guaranteed money. Trey Lyles was a part of the rotation, and Sasha's getting more money than him. And then Coach Brown came out and said he don't know if he's going to be in the rotation. So like, that's the difference between me and Sasha. Like I, mm -hmm. I was getting the opportunity. Sasha got guaranteed money that's unheard of coming from Europe unless you're the guy. And unless, that's unless why you, unless you're European. <laughs> <laughs> but go on. <laughs> No. <laughs> I, so I, I'm kind of surprised that you know Mike Brown just came out and said he doesn't know if Sasha's going to be in the rotation because it's like they went to the playoffs and they got their rotation they kept everyone that they needed to keep so then why did they sign him for that money when you know they signed Trey Lyles to I think two years 10 and Trey Lyles played well for them in the playoffs so I, I'm kind of confused by that that they know I mean, I I know the answer, but like, like I said, like that's I, I wanna I, I gotta I gotta I gotta I got a question for you. Um, I got a question for you regarding you being on the fourth team because I think it falls in line with the things you mentioned about you know being pro B and going to community college, going to JUCO, or whatever. And you mentioned like, oh, that's kind of par for the course for me. Like you expected that, and you got to fight against that. So were yeah. you able to tell? What hurt you and what, why you weren't able to, why wasn't that the expectation going into training camp? You know, like, oh, I'm going to be on the fourth team. I'm going to have to fight against that. Why did that affect you being on the fourth team more so than being pro B or being Juco? I guess because it was the NBA. Like, this okay. was, this was like, this was like the final hurdle. And obviously, I didn't expect to come in and be in the rotation. Like, my, the way my contract was set up, I needed to make the team first. So like I'm not a victim, but I'm just looking back on it, on everything that happened. Like I know that that affected my mindset. Like I was seeing the rotations from day to day, and you know I'm I'm waiting for the coach to tell me what team and what color. And everyone's like, you know, you got guys that are on the main team every time. Now, you got guys that are rotating, and I'm waiting every time to hear my name on like the gray team at least. And it was always, you know, the last team. I think it was red. Red was last and purple was third. And I was just, I don't know, I just let it affect my, my head too much. And then I started, like, hesitating and turning down open shots and, like, trying to drive when I shouldn't have driven and trying to, I'm playing good defense and I'm trying, I'm trying to, like, make the home run play. And I'm like, why did I do that? So, like, it just, yeah, it just screwed me. It just screwed me. And I knew that. I knew that they were right in um, forcing me to go to Stockton, and I didn't blame them for that. And I'm not a victim for any of this. I'm just staying my experience. No, 100%. Why, why do you why do you think Sacramento signed you? Uh, <laughs> I think because Mike Brown was the coach for you know Team Nigeria. I played with Team Nigeria when we beat USA. Um, I know they like me and. There was other teams that liked me, but I think that's the main reason. I know that I know that the GMs, I, weren't, I wasn't their first option for sure. I know they wanted Sasha that summer. And, yeah, like they kept, you know, they delayed things with me, and I felt it that, you know, they liked me, but they weren't, you know, sold on me. Even though when I signed, when I made the team opening day, they were like, um, you know, they see me being part of the team for years to come, and I'm like, Okay. So do you, let's say when you get the chance to go back again, let's say, God willing, you get the, the Sasha type deal. Let's say you get five five a year again, whatever whatever he got, seven, six, whatever it was, right? Seven a year. Seven a year. Um, and this is kind of a general question for both of y'all, but how important is it to go into training camp? Because, like, you see Sasha got the deal, and he still might not be in the rotation. So how important is it to go into training camp with that same 
kind of, I don't want to say underdog, but for lack of a better term, I guess underdog mindset that you've had your whole career and how difficult is it for, as an athlete goods for everybody to, to maintain that hungry mindset um, regardless of when you feel like you've quote unquote made it? Yeah, I, I think, I think I'm always going to be hungry as long as I'm playing. If I don't, if I lose my hunger and I lose my passion to play the way that I play, then I'm done. But if I sign a contract that's fully guaranteed, that changes the whole thing, you know. For me, like, yeah, the way my contract was set up, they could have cut me in that moment and they wouldn't have had to pay me. They would have had to pay me, you know, whatever they had to pay me, right? Mm -hmm. But Sasha doesn't need to play. His money is guaranteed. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Three years, not just one year. Three years versus me getting 250 guaranteed when I sign. It's a big difference. Your, your mental... You can you can go to the Kings practice facility every day and know that I'm gonna be getting paid somewhere. Even mm -hmm. if they trade me, I'm gonna be getting paid somewhere. If if God forbid they cut him and he goes back to Europe, he's still gonna get paid. That was not the, that was not the case for me. I get. I think that's a, big, that's a big thing. No, I I agree with you on that. I guess what I'm asking y'all is how important is it to let's say you do have Sasha's deal? How important is it to go in there with the mindset that you had the deal that you had? Like, oh, I gotta go in and prove it every day, especially going into the NBA. It depends on what your goals are. If your goals are like, this is a good story. Uh, Gabe Vincent, one of my good friends since college, right? He signed the three year thirty three that he just signed, and I said, bro, congrats. How does that feel? He said. She said something along the lines of like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one. Like, so if that's your mentality, you know, that's incredible. Obviously some people coming from Europe, that's the, that's the, the ceiling right there. And it's okay. 7 million a year is, that's a lot of money for 99% of the world. So it depends on your perspective, where you come from, what you want to do. Some people don't want to be, some Europeans don't want to be in the NBA for that long. Mm -hmm. You want to get that one deal and go back. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that was probably the uh, the most important thing you just said is I think there's a lot of Europeans that want to try the NBA and if it works out cool, but I feel like a lot of them don't necessarily want to bend over backwards just to break a rotation and play 10 to 15 minutes. You know, what I mean, uh, they'll go back home and, you know, just really appreciate it, you know, and get get appreciated and, and you know, make similar type of money. So that's where I look at like a guy like Misic. I look at his situation with all those guards over there. Like, where are the minutes coming from? And then it's like, how is he going to feel, you know, not playing? Because, I mean, you heard it from, you know, Americans and Europeans that have gone over to the NBA, not had the role that they wanted, and then they was ready to leave. And, you know, we, we've heard about guys going through depression and all that other stuff. And, let alone don't be in a bad city, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't be in a in a trash city in the States and you're not from there, you know? So I, I think that there's, like you said, there's, there's, it depends on what your goals are, but yeah, I mean, obviously if you're trying to make a team, like you have to, you know, you're going to have to do all those little things and maintain that hunger. But I think, you know, and hearing Chima's story and I, I always think back to when we had Shane on there and he was saying that, and Shane was saying that like he, he he wasn't who he had, who he had been his entire career. You know, he changed his game thinking he had to be a true point and all this other stuff. And I think that, you know, for a lot of guys that get that opportunity, just just be who you are. Like if you Sasha, go shoot the ball and back and back cut. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they know you're not defended. Like, you know what I'm saying? Go do what you're supposed to do. Okay. See, see that's my okay. That's my thank you for saying that. <laughs> Sacramento knew what they were getting with Sasha. So I don't want to hear, oh well, he's not defending. Was he def was he defending in Europe? Don't is is it? I thought he was a solid team defender when he played for Olympiacos, right? He's so big. if they're if they're saying that he wasn't a good defender and now he's not defending, that's one thing. But if they're saying, oh, he's a great shooter and all of this, but he doesn't play defense, then why did you sign him? Like this, you signed this guy for this amount of money trust him and let him play and i wish him the best i remember seeing him at the final four and and you know telling him my experience and i thought his i thought he would like honestly jump into the rotation and be like the seventh or eighth man 
and it's not working out like that right now. It's preseason, but I wish him the best because I know he he's got the goods, and they love they liked him there. So yeah, that goes back to making the question who's who's making decisions and and what <laughs> and then you know who's who's getting what. But that's a that all goes into maybe a slight international bias, I guess. Um, slight major. I don't know what y'all think. I'll say major, but it's. <laughs> I don't know what what do y'all think of of the seemingly international bias in the NBA, and we've talked about this before, Timo, on this podcast. So I'll, I'll let you yep. answer first, but I'll just point out examples such as you know a Brad Wanamaker or uh, Malcolm Delaney who went back and you know I think Brad at first was getting two way two way offers maybe, mm-hmm. and you look at a guy like Michich who. Maybe he's a, had a little bit more success than Brad, I suppose, um, but you know yeah. marginal. Um, and he's getting whatever five, six a year. So do y'all feel well, like he can get I get a little more than that? Ain't he? He can get about he nine? I think he, nine. he signed three, three years, twenty three and twenty three. I think yeah, yeah, like eight, eight, seven, eight. Okay. So do do y'all? What do y'all think of the international bias? And then as uh, Nigerian born, growing up in Australia, do you ever feel do you feel excluded from the international bias? Uh I think, you know, the NBA is going global, you know, like Jokic has helped with that. Giannis has helped with that. You know, I think it's good because they're trusting EuroLeague guys more. You know, yes, the contracts that guys would get in, there's a big discrepancy. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of American guys that I see talking about the NBA, they're talking about summer league opportunities or two ways, like you said, or minimum deals, you know, and. Off the top of my head, like, yeah, you, Lazenko, Micic, Contecchio, guaranteed multi million. Compazzo. Compazzo, like, guaranteed multi. It's, it's different. Um, for me, I think growing up in Australia, when I came to college, Australians were like going to college and like that was, that was it. You know, there was probably eight Australians in the NBA at the time, maybe less. But now it's like that pathway is, is open. You know, they got the NBL program, so it's different. If I was a little bit younger, I would be very happy with that situation <laughs> because it'll make, you know, going to the NBA and getting a, a nice deal, you know, more favorable. But I'm happy that the NBA is more international because there's a lot of great players in the world. Yeah, I think I think the uh, I think that there there is a, a international agenda, in my opinion. And I also think that a lot of it has to do with the way the game has changed too, you know, with it being so three point heavy. I mean, we've always said, you know, all the shooters are in Europe and, uh, back when the game was a little slower and a little more, um, I I mean, it's still ISO driven, but I mean, I think now there's a lot more space for these guys that can shoot the rock and, uh, and not defend, especially if you got other pieces around you. You don't have those back to the basket bigs. Everybody wants the high flyer, rebound, and shot blocker. So now you can pair him up with that four man that doesn't necessarily defend as well, and that can really shoot the rock. So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but I, I think that I mean we'd be we'd be crazy not to say that there, or we'd be crazy to say that there isn't a bias because as you name as you name all those European players that have gotten guaranteed deals. And, um, you know, conversely, you look at the Americans that have gotten opportunities um, to come over. It's it's different. And I think, too, we also have to keep in mind that the salary cap is way different than it than it used to be. Now, I mean, these teams do have to you do have to sign guys to uh, or you do have to use a certain amount of that salary cap. So that does free up some money to get some of these European guys. Whereas when the salary cap was lower, if you're going to pay, if Malcolm Delaney is making, Malcolm Delaney is making a two mil, you know what I'm saying? After taxes overseas, that means you got to pay him what for at least four in the States, you know what I'm saying? Four or five in the States. And it's the same thing with Sasha and Mises and them. It's like, they're not coming over for less. You know what I'm saying? Okay, okay, okay. But you talking about back then? What about Mike James? Did the NBA stint two years ago? What? How is? How did Mike James not get? Uh, some bad six, intel. Seven, it was some bad he, intel. He he. Okay. A lot of bad intel. <laughs> well, he someone still they they still took him right? Huh? 
They still to took him. Brooklyn still took oh, him. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm talking about by that time for sure. But go ahead, JT. Mike James just has uh, all the all the love and respect. I hope he pull up on this show one day because I'd love to hear some of his story. But, like, I feel he has probably one of the toughest, actually toughest, just because his game, like, he scores. Like, you go into the NBA and you got to go, like, we don't we don't need you to come get you know fifteen. I do agree with 15, that. Fifteen, sure. seventeen. You know what I'm saying? Like He's super gonna, high usage. Yeah, and you're gonna shoot realistically when he went. What he shot? He shot like forty percent, which is it's fine. Like for a guard, right? I think was he it? shot in the thirties when he came to Brooklyn. He shot in the thirties, I think. Okay, so yeah. yeah, which I mean, again, as a as a smaller guard, like whatever. But it's just like that. That's a that's a tough sell. So that's I'm all for y'all went PC with it, and I was really waiting for my because. I th- I compare this international bias. I probably view it how some people in the states viewed affirmative action, which is mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's nonsense. <laughs> like I think I'm tired of it. I think mm-hmm. that I think it 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 is what it is. I think I'm not saying these guys can't play, but I just the way that European guys specifically are evaluated is based on oh well they played in in Euroleague or ACB, so they're more ready for the NBA, but Americans specifically, we've been seeing these dudes our whole lives. Like, there's no adjustment necessary for real. Like, maybe the style of play, fine, whatever. But, like, we've been seeing – I grew up playing against Derrick Rose and Eric Gordon since I was 16. So, I don't yeah. – there's no – there's no, oh, I need to readjust to that or anything. I know what it is already. And then on top of that, I feel like there's – like I asked you, there's an exclusion of certain people from the international bias. Like, I don't think that – uh specifically i mean i don't think that you have a lot of guys say when nigeria was going to the olympics they had a lot of dudes who were playing really well really well in different places and they were not getting the same opportunities that some of the european players were getting um so that's i'm just i think the international bias has got to readjust itself in a sense that's a you could do a whole podcast on that topic (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Uh, that ass, that ass. But uh, good, you got the you got the culture yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Man, go ahead, fire away. Nah, switching gears, we're going into the culture segment. Uh, it was announced that Shaquille O'Neal and Allen Iverson have become the president and vice president of Reebok Basketball. So my question is: Is it too late for Reebok to make a comeback and return to where it was in the in, in the early two thousands, late nineties? Or is it an open play, playing field for for Reebok right it's, now? It's never too late. You just need the right people to endorse the product. Need the right people to endorse it. I'm sure if they get someone that's popping to sign over there, it'll it'll change the wave. Like that's people follow trends, and like it's you follow trends of the per, the right person that's you know making that trend. So with Shaq and AI, like that's that's buzz right there. But like they need. Some current guys to bring bring Reebok back. I think. I, I think it's I think it's too late. I think it's over. <laughs> I ain't gonna hold you in the sense of like what you say, Chief. I agree with you. Like you can create some buzz and maybe have some excitement around the brand, but you know, in terms of Reebok was a I don't know the numbers, but they were a pretty big player back in the two thousands. Like you had the questions, you had the, you had a whole bunch of stuff going on. Whereas now I just feel like Nike has even New Balance. You see this kind of uh, insurgence in New Balance, but they're not really a player for real. Like uh, you I think, see a couple commercials. I think <laughs> designers. I think designers is is what you really need. Like obviously you're gonna need players, but like if you got a good player and the shoes just isn't designed well, like I don't even know what Kawhi's shoes look like. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what none of them New Balance joints look like. I barely even know what Steph's joints look like. You know what I'm saying? Hey, stop, stop, stop. I don't know. I'm, facts. I'm wearing Curry Sixes every day. You need to take those off. Take them off. You don't know, like, yo, to take, to take those off. I say Curry Sixes only. Like, those those are my favorite basketball shoes ever. Curry Word? Sixes. Shout out. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm telling you. Curry's not bad. I wore some Curry last year. I'm just not like, any Curry, though. I'm telling you, the Curry Sixes, like, look them up. They All different. right, what number is he on now? You said a Curry six. That was Just that was two thousand. That, that was twenty eighteen. That was my rookie year. Okay, so he's on so, at least ten, right? Got, I think it's eleven now. Yeah, he's on ten, eleven. So, all right, so if you want for eleven, 
I, I don't feel like that's I don't feel like that's enough to sustain a shoe brand. And I think that the uh the design is is what's important. And then, you know, you go with uh, you know, the athletes and all that other stuff. But uh, I, agree I that. think that's where Nike is just head over heels above everybody else is just, you know, the shoes look dope. I think some of the Pumas actually look kinda cool over the last few years. A couple of them looked all right. But uh, I, I think yeah. if Reebok don't get the designers in there and then get the bodies, like you got to bring cash money back, you know, get them in the Jabos and the classics. Like you got to kind of bring back a whole resurgence and, uh, you know, kind of get it popping from there. The, uh, the Curry, the Curry 10s was all right. I wore the Curry 10s and them joints was decent. You bought them? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> what I look like, man. A new, my teammate, my two, teammate actually is a New Balance athlete, Matt Morgan. He has. I don't even know what model they are. Yeah, but they actually they look decent. So damn, Under Armour, Under Armour. Nah, cool on that. But uh, hey, moving man. on to hey. the last segment. <laughs> hey man, moving on to I the last serious. segment. We got paycheck, rain check. Somebody's paycheck is taking a rain check, man. And I'm uh. I'm not even going to highlight a specific player. We're just going to do a team and a state, man. Is there something <laughs> in the water in Charlotte? I mean, Miles Bridges allegedly got back in trouble. Kai Jones, we know he's been acting up over the last month, and not to mention, uh, you know, uh, Boot Knights got into some trouble over there. So, mm. you know, what, why are there so many character <laughs> issues coming out of, like, one organization? Is it the location? Is it the lack of tough veteran leadership? Like, where does you know multiple character flaws or issues? Hold on, you're not gonna mention Lamelo Ball dating a porn star. What's wrong with that though? Is that a character yeah. issue? Is that a character? That's yes, like, yes. That's not a char- That's not. <laughs> yes. That's half. That's half the NBA, man. Nah, no, yeah, yeah. nah. That's half. Some people Lamelo Ball did not grow up like that. Like, come on, yo. That's what about Zion? Zion not in Charlotte. Is Zion not dating a porn star? He was just. Pipe in a porn star. Nah, he was he was paying bills. He had a he had a relationship. That's not dating a porn star. That was that's number two. No, it's not. That's just he had Leangelo, a whole Leangelo, Leangelo's baby mama. What, what she is? <laughs> Levar, Levar doing all this building leagues and stuff. He need to go back and talk to them. Because he said it. He said it. you just can't. <laughs> anyway, no, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I would say the Charlotte thing. I've heard. I've heard some bad things about like the organization, just in terms of accountability like the guys they bring like there's certain things that shouldn't be tolerated and just seems to be tolerated more over there and it's unfortunate you know i don't like speaking on people's like personal lives and things like that because i don't know the cases but the miles bridges thing is is interesting because they said he violated something that happened months ago so that kind of confused me and then he posted like his his profile picture is johnny depp you know, trying to prove, I, I don't know. It's a lot going on, but Charlotte has too many question marks right now. It's not good. What's, what's crazy is we just had this conversation, my teammates, one of my teammates is from Charlotte, and he says that Charlotte is like baby Atlanta. And because yeah. Charlotte is like baby Atlanta, dudes are out there just losing their mind. Like, there's just too much going on. And I'm sure, like you said, there's probably not a lot of veteran leadership, but – Man, like I said, I blame Lamelo. Yeah, I'm, a- <laughs> <laughs> I'm, cool, I'm cool with that. <laughs> nah, I mean, I think, I think too, man. I, I think the uh, the veteran leadership, man. Who was uh who was the player? Remember uh, Chris Heron? The mm. he played he played with Boston. He was like drugged out and uh, drug uh, addict. Yeah, and right, I man. guess when he was uh after he got drafted and stuff, one of the vets was like, "Yo, like all this shit stops, like whatever it is." And he was straight until he like went back. You know what I'm to saying? Boston, yeah, right? yeah, until he went back to Boston. But I think that, you know, especially when you're young and you're coming into the league, like you do need somebody that's going, as you said, hold you accountable. You know, not just the front office. Like I think it has to be somebody within the organization. Like, and even just to tell you, like, look, young fella, like quit dancing and sweating on IG live and you know what I'm saying just like turn your phone off for a little bit and go you know go do what you do on the court you know what I'm saying or just tone it down a little bit i think sometimes you know the um that that voice needs to come from like a peer 
you know, for certain individuals. And then I think, you know, sometimes it does need to come from the organization and, uh, you know, but it's just, I, I, I've been seeing it over the last couple of years. I'm just like, yo, what is going on over there? It's just been, a, yeah. it's been a not mess. great. Not great at all. Who is the oldest person on that team? <laughs> That's Who is the best on that team? I was just thinking that. <laughs> Man, you got to look that up. Uh, I, I, I don't that? know. Let me see here. Is Gordon Hayward? He's not there. Oh, yeah, no, I was saying, is Gordon Hayward still there? If, if he is, it's got to be him, right? It might be. Yeah, I think it might be. And that's, yeah, that ain't going to. Well, and he um, probably just with the family and stuff. Yeah, so saying, he's going yeah. <laughs> Terry, yeah, Rose, Gordon. Terry Rozier. Terry Rozier might be up there now. Terry Rozier got into something too, didn't he? Exactly, he did. Yeah. So, you, yeah, it's different. Yeah, no, nah, I think, yeah, Gordon might be, he might be the OG over there. He's got to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you saw what Kelly Oubre said about, like, just – what he he just says some brutal about they got no chance, no hope to win, and like they do things backwards over there. It's it's yeah, it's not a coincidence, man. Yeah, it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough, but yeah, it is Gordon Hayward at thirty three. Mason Plumley still over there? Nah, he in L.A. The Clippers, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, this is last year's right. And then Terry Terry Rozier at twenty nine. After that, yeah. Um, Damn, didn't uh, – who's over there from – Amari Bailey's there now too, no? Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. That's tough yeah, to talk yeah. about. Yeah, he that, could be, that could be a tough situation. Very. That could be a tough situation. But listen, man, that's all we got for you. Anything else you want to add, promote, shout out, anything like that? No, nah, I'm just – you know, by Basconia EuroLeague season, we got a chance to do some, some great um, – we still got a lot to learn, but, yeah – it's a breakout year for me too. Um, ACB MVP, be on the watch out. Right, All Euro be yes, on the watch out. Yes, sir. All right. Hey, I'm pulling up Sunday too. I'm pulling up Sunday. Oh yeah, heard you. Yeah, yeah, easy. Up, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm it's pulling up Sunday, shit, man. man. Appreciate you, man. No doubt. Chima Moneke, appreciate you joining us. That is the Role Player Podcast. Make sure you check us out on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere else you get your podcast. And be sure to follow along on all social media. That's YouTube, IG, TikTok, and Twitter with the handle at Role Player Media. Also on Switch Culture, Swiss Swish Culture's YouTube page, and you can tap below to subscribe. Appreciate you joining us, and we'll catch y'all next time.